you know, when you said we have to give our testimony, that makes me really nervous. I'm going to tell you about my journey out of Mormonism. Um, when, when I was little, I was the baby of seven, and Mormonism was everything to me. I, I was the only active member in my, my family. Um, my dad would tell me, you can go to church, but it's never done me any good. Um, okay. But it was never, there was never another option. It was either Mormonism or nothing. So, yeah, I came from a small town, lived in the Delta, maybe you know where that is, you know where that is. Uh, grew up on a farm, kind of stuff. Um, when I went away to college, um, I married a return missionary, we went to the temple, I was home evening mom, I was president of young women's, I did all that. Um, but when I was standing in the temple, getting married to this, turned out to be a not nice guy, I'm thinking, Looking in that mirror, and if you've been through the temple, you know what I mean, that forever, I'm like, the thought went through my, I don't want to be with this guy forever. Oh. <laughs> now is a bad time. <laughs> what was I thinking? And then all the little secret stuff they do in the temple, and I'm thinking, why didn't nobody tell me that I belong to a cult, <laughs> and yeah, I guess I, I just didn't realize all that. Um, okay, okay, all right, I got this, I can do this. Um, God, it feels weird talking about this, I don't think I've ever talked about this to anyone. Um, you know, alone a whole room of people. <laughs> but, so, I could never have children. So in the Mormon church, that was bad. So then the rumor went around that I just, I wasn't going to have kids because I wanted all the husbands. Uh, of course. Of course. <laughs> Which couldn't be further from the truth. Um, I was from a poor family, so when I would walk in, I didn't have all the clothes that everybody had. So, you know, you get the, the look. You're like, you're really wearing that? <laughs> I'm lucky to have this, thank you. So, I got divorced, and again, that was, that was not good still believing that I was going to do everything I could to have this, to do everything right in Mormonism. And so my church that I went to kind of shunned me um, because I got divorced and broke up a temple marriage and blah, blah, blah. So I would go hide in churches, in the back of churches. Do you know people would not even talk to me? I mean, they would act like, I don't know, it was, it was really odd to me. It was really odd. So I'm like, all right, I'll show you all. So I did that for a long time, and I had a lot of fun, and I met this wonderful man, and we've been together 36 years now. <laughs> <laughs> but so when I met him and you know we were smoking, drinking, partying, we were having a good time. We we tried to get married in the Mormon church, but we had lived together beforehand. So we were gonna have to go talk to the bishop. And that's when I said Absolutely not. What gives you the right to judge me? You know? 
I feel like I have one judge and that's not you. So, um, we kind of left at that point. Um, we never went to church. We never talked about church. We never did church. We never, I just stopped all ties with Mormonism. Unless you cut, you know, on the boat, on strawberry. That's heaven. Yeah, that was heaven. <laughs> but yeah, so we just never went to church. So his sister was, or is, Christian. Oh, one Easter I was born, and I'm like, okay, can I go to church with you? They go to Calvary. And it was, they were holding it down at the Mountain, what is it called? America the Mountain America Discovery. Center. Yeah. And I see all these people out there. I'm like, okay, all right. I'm going to smoke in the parking lot. Let's see if you talk to me then. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I did. And they talked to me. And they hugged me. And I purposely smelled like cigarette smoke. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, this is really weird. <laughs> so I get inside. And they start singing about God and the Lamb. And it wasn't about, it was about Jesus. It was all, you could feel the love of Jesus. It wasn't about Joseph Smith and how great he was and all of this other stuff. It was about God. And i looking around and I just started to cry. I walked in nothing. I came out Christian. Oh, and so I get home and I'm like, I didn't dare tell him because he's like, yeah, those, those 40 day Christians. <laughs> I think you were all weird. Don't the Bible thumpers. <laughs> now we're baby Bible thumpers. <laughs> yeah, baby Bible thumpers. So anyway, there was a lot of uh, a lot of stress with that, but I would go to um, well, so I guess I should start here. So we asked if we could go to church with his sister. This is a couple years later. No. Or a year later. It was a year later. Uh, can we go to church with you? And they're like, well, yeah. I'm like, okay, so I think I'm not going to like it. But, you know, and we already know Julie has attitude. God gave me red hair for a warning label, so. <laughs> <laughs> I go in there, hide my smoke, walk in, everybody's hugging me. pot out here and it's free. <laughs> I bet I can't take it inside. Oh my god, I can. And so yeah, I, I walked in with my, I had like a checklist. If they don't talk to me because I smell like cigarettes, I'm gone. If I don't get to have my coffee, I'm gone. If I have to look a certain way or wear certain things, I'm gone. And it was like, just so easy. I'm like, okay. So we went to church a few times. And I went up to the pastor after and I said, all right. Because we're thinking we're liking this. But I'm like, mm, I don't know. What are the rules? <laughs> <laughs> so I asked the pastor, I said, what are the rules around here? And he said, uh, come here long enough to figure about yourself. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, so what is tithing settlement? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, we don't have tithing settlement. I said, so do you keep track of how much tithing I pay? He's like, uh, no. <laughs> uh, I'm like, okay, so am I required, what are my requirements? And I, I just couldn't get past that. What are my rules? <laughs> Julie, God loves you. Yes. 
No. Um, I didn't know what the cross was for. And Pastor Terry at Calvary has taught us a lot about the Bible. I did four years of seminary. I graduated seminary. I, I did all that stuff and knew nothing of the Bible. I can see you the song, you know, the Genesis. That's, that's, that's about it. <laughs> Explain seminary to a lot of people don't know what. Oh, they don't know what seminary is? So, a seminary is like during high school, um, you take one of your hours of classes when you get an elective and you go to Mormon study. Like the study of it actually starts in junior high. Yeah. But I had to go early in the morning because I didn't want to give up any of my classes because kind of an overachiever. So I had to <laughs> do extra. But yeah, so learning all that stuff, I'm like, okay, so tell me what the cross is for. And Pastor Terry I swear that this guy just rolls his eyes at me sometimes. <laughs> because I, I come up with the weirdest questions. But like I still want to know why, if he, d if he did light on one day, why, how come the moon and stars weren't done until the next day? <laughs> just a question I have. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, so anyway, we, we decided to get baptized. Um, now I was baptized Mormon. I, I'm thinking, so you know, you have to go through this class. And I'm thinking, great, here comes the rules. <laughs> and <laughs> Pastor Jim was in there, and he's like, okay, you realize that there's not three levels of heaven. What? If I get baptized, I'm going to the top level. <laughs> He's like, uh, no. <laughs> okay. So, then if I get baptized, it wipes away all my sins. No. So we had to go through this class, and I learned a lot that it was already done. I don't have to try so hard. I don't have to feel that guilt. I didn't want to be in a religion that made you guilty, made it, I thought God was loving, but then how come I feel so guilty all the time? That just didn't feel right to me. Learning what the cross was about was huge. And you know that it was done. I'm forgiven. It's okay. I'm never going to be perfect. I don't have to be an overachiever. It'll be okay. And that was a hard lesson to learn. Um, we've been we've been going. You know, we've been Christians now about six years. And I've gone to several Bible studies. And. One day I won this thing that says, glory comes in the morning. Crap. I've never seen it. What? And there, so my class was like, well, Julie, I'm like, no, nope, don't tell me. I'm figuring this one out on my own. And it took me a while to figure out why they told me that glory comes in the morning. Oh, there's so many things over those six years, like, we took a class that, well, we tried to take a class. Somebody got angry. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was uh, witnessing the Mormons in love. With love. I found out everything that I had believed and been told my whole life was a lie. How could I be so stupid? How could I be so wrong? I'm a smart person. I've got a college degree. How did I not Fortune. see this for two? <laughs> How did I not see this? Why 
why did I trust those people? And that's been the hardest thing for me. So I had to quit going to that class because it just made me more and more and more angry. So it came around again, I'm like, okay, I'm ready this time. Yeah, I didn't make it through it again. Third <laughs> <laughs> much. I'm, I'm done. <laughs> I'm out. Okay. Um, so basically that's about it. It's just uh, our adventure. And I think the hardest thing still is is being able to know that it's okay. And every day I feel like we're learning something new. It's a new adventure. And God keeps putting these people that are coming out of Mormonism in my path. I'm like, oh, are you funny? I don't know the answers. <laughs> <laughs> um, what a great little group there. So, yeah, same thing. I was, I was baptized and raised Mormon. My mother was Mormon. My father was Catholic. Um, my father was not active. My mother was a Sunday school teacher. She was pretty active. And I went, you know, my, my whole young life, teenage life, probably in my early to late teens, I started asking questions. Questions that I just, I couldn't figure out why, you know, I, I said, if God is the king, how can a mortal man change his word? And I kept getting pushed aside. I kept asking this question over and over and over. And I'm always pushed aside on this question. So finally, I was about 19 years old, 19 or 20, probably 19. I asked that question again. I said, I need an answer. I need to know how you can actually believe that a mortal man can change the word of God and we live by what the mortal man says and not what's in the scriptures, the word of God. And I was called into the bishop's office and the state president was in there. They told me I needed to quit asking questions. I said, good. Okay. And I walked out. So... In my first marriage, my, my first wife was LDS also, so I tried it again. Um, I became the ward athletic director, and same thing, I started asking questions. And was told again, shut up, quit asking these questions. These are questions you need to know. Just know that that's how it is. No, it's not how it is. Not in my mind, it's not how it is. Well, I get divorced, and, and uh, you know, God works in mysterious ways. When I was divorced, when I first got divorced, um, I've been in the food business my entire life. And I was doing this traveling food show. It started in Boise, Idaho. And we came down through several towns in Idaho, through Logan, Brigham City, down through Salt Lake, all the way down to St. George. This was a two-week traveling show. By the time I got down to St. George, my hair was out of control. <laughs> so I'm walking down St. George Boulevard, driving down St. George Boulevard. I see this beauty salon. I thought, oh well, I'll go in there. So I go in and this gorgeous tall blonde cuts my hair. Beautiful girl. But I noticed she was married. And she was quite a bit younger than I was. So, <laughs> so later in life, um, so needless to say, you know, I was asked those questions again and walked away. And uh, then her and I met like two years later. And I didn't think anything of it, but she was showing me scrapbooks that she had made. And she showed me this beauty shop that she owned in St. George. Well, <laughs> you're the tall blonde to cut my hair. <laughs> so, I mean, God set us up to be together. I know He did. That just happened. And so, when we decided to get married, she said we, we had the bishop over. We talked to the bishop about marrying us, and he said, well, number one, you've lived together, as she said. He said, but number two, have you ever had a temple divorce? Because you were married in the temple. She said, no. He said, then I next need to excommunicate you. 
And I said, while you're at it, take my name off those records, which, as you all know, they won't do because they need the numbers. Um, and we never walked into church again, and as she said, we never talked about it. Um, that day that we did walk into Calvary Chapel, she said, we walked in and, and I got a bit of a heart problem. <laughs> and as we walked in, there were so many people coming up saying, you're the guy we've been praying for. I mean, it just shocked me. But my sister and brother-in-law had been going there, and they always had people praying for me. For 30 years. For 30 years. They never know. About 20 years they've been praying for me. And I was just blown away by this. And so after we the sermon, we sit down, and we, as she said, the music started playing. I was in awe of the, of the worship group that we have at Calvary Chapel. And then... Tell them about the hats. The what? They would raise their hands. You know how we do? Oh, yeah. you know how. <laughs> or just the one hand. <laughs> We're sitting there like, do they have questions? <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> we thought they all had questions. We finally understood. <laughs> but... Uh, you know, as she said, my sister and brother-in-law tried to get us there forever. And I always thought, as I said, you people are strange. You were funny to me. Until I got to know you. Then I wanted to be you. And I still want to be you. You guys are amazing. I'm still learning. We're still baby Bible thumpers. But I can tell you that first time we walked in to Calvary Chapel, I listened to the music, and then I listened to Pastor Terry. And when he was done, I turned to her and said, this is home. This is absolute home. Terry talks about, and, and I iterate that, that God makes it so easy for us. God just says, seek me and love me. Love each other. Everything else will come together. He doesn't ask us to be religious. He doesn't ask us to settle our tithing or whatever it might be. He doesn't ask us to wear funny underwear. He just, he doesn't do that. He just says, love me and love each other. And that is so amazing. And so after we got going there, um, my health went downhill. And I was in having a cardio alert. That's where they boom, shock you and bring your heart back into rhythm. Well, it didn't work, and it slowed my heart down so much that it started running backwards. So it was filling my lungs up with blood. And I went into what they call flash pulmonary, pulmonary edema. And, man, I thought I was telling her goodbye. I looked at her as they were pulling her out of the room. The weird part is they, they got me up to walk to make sure I could walk before this. And about halfway down the hall, I said, something's wrong. Something is not right here. So she yelled for a, a wheelchair. Somebody, I remember somebody throwing an office chair down the hall. It wasn't a wheelchair. It was an office chair, yeah. Come flying down the hall. <laughs> she sat me in that. She's pushing me down the hall in an office chair. There's we're going down the hall, they're calling it cold blue. And I'm thinking, oh, that poor person. They called, they called it for me. <laughs> we get in, they get me up on the bed, and my room fills up with people. And as I say, then I, I, I can breathe, can catch my breath. I look at her and I said, you need to leave. And they're pulling her and her girlfriend, our friend, out of the room. And I'm waving, thinking, this is it. That's the last time I'm going to see her. The next thing I remember, I'm out. But I'm hearing this voice just constantly praying over me. I mean, this voice is just boom, 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 going nonstop. Well, it's, it's a gentleman that we met at Calvary. His name was John Douglas, John and Chris and Douglas. They became very good friends. Unfortunately, they moved to Colorado. They're still good friends, but not close. But that guy stood over my bed and prayed for, what, two days? Just nonstop. And I, I'm out, but I'm hearing it. And I guess I would squeeze his hand or put a thumb up. I just kept doing that. That's just God working me. Just God testing me. Are you still going to come back to me? I'm giving you all this, this crap over here. Are you going to come back to me? Well, I couldn't wait to get back to God. And about, what, a year later, two years later, um, I was in the hospital on septic. They 
called the whole family together, said he will not be here in the morning. Again, John Douglas and a guy named Miguel Loret. And I, I'm out. They're standing over me praying. I'm hearing it. Not only did I hear them, I mean, this is a strange thing, but I felt that I was floating in a room anyway. And they were doing all this stuff to me. And they had me in a medically induced coma. They had you on ice. And they thought I was just completely out. I was, but I could feel everything they were doing. Yeah. So I felt them put the tubes down my throat. Um, they cut my jugular, I felt that. Um, they had to put a catheter in, I felt that. But I, I'm numb and out enough that I can't tell them what's going on. I'm watching this whole thing happen. They dump these blankets on me, then dump cold ice water over me because I was like 106 degree temperature. And again, they're calling her and the kids in saying, go say your goodbyes. He won't be here in the morning. These two guys standing over me praying. I woke up three days later. And I'm still here today. And that was four years ago. And I have not been back in the hospital since. That's just God working for me. Um, yes, praise God. I can tell you, I've, I've become so active in the church now. I, I'm the leader of our hospitality group, which is our ushers in the sanctuary, our greeters at the doors, our people that are out in the lobby. Um, I do a thing every Thursday night that, that Rob does as well. In fact, he's got a shirt on right now. It says, Foods for Family. We actually have food that families come through in their cars, um, and we load them. We absolutely load them up. But as they come through, there's seven slots, and they'll pull into a slot, and we get their, just their name and how many's in their family. Then we ask them if they, we can pray for them. And I'm on that prayer team, and I'm telling you, that is more of a blessing to me than it is to them. To be able to hear these people's problems that they're having and pray for them, to me, is an amazing feeling. I mean, I just... Coming from the guy who said he couldn't pray. You're welcome. I still don't think I can, but it works because you know God takes God takes God takes over, and, and I'm telling you, I don't know how many times I've opened my eyes praying for these people and they're just sobbing. I know God said something, right? It wasn't me. It was God. Um, you know, so I am all in. I do that on Thursday nights. I do the hospitality ministry. I'm a leader of uh, one of the leaders of the choir for Easter. And, and uh, Christmas. In fact, this gentleman right here was in my choir this last Christmas. We had a we had a great time. We do we do the Christmas service at the Broadmill Hall, and we fill it. We had 1,200 and some people here this year for our Christmas uh, service, and it was on Christmas Day. But I can tell you, without a fact, I'm all in. <laughs> I've got a tattoo that says "Forgiven." I don't know if you can see this one from there. That's Jesus with the uh, crown of, or thorn of crowns and blood coming down on my arm. Um, I've got a pierced hair with a cross in it. I can, I can honestly tell you, I know for a fact that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. And He has just done amazing things for both of us in our lives. And we figured out what the cross was for. Well, no, we didn't. <laughs> we certainly did. You know, it's just, again, God has made this so easy for us. Just seek Him, love Him, and love each other. And just stay in the Word. That's, that's the most important thing to do. And we say this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Are there any quick questions? Anybody have any questions for my for my Julie? Not all at once, right? <laughs> <laughs> I just want it. Would you come in and see if you can do it? Everybody can hear you. I just want to ask that um, when you when you came out of the moment, when you came 
out. My question is, your thinking, your, your thought pattern, what was that like? Were you afraid? Was it, you know, what was going on on the inside of you? You know, were you questioning yourself or, or what? I'll let you go first. For me, I was, thanks for that question. For me, it was, I was, I was really hurt. This church that I loved, these people that I loved, I made a mistake, and now they don't love me? What? Um, I was really hurt. And I'm just kind of feisty enough that I'm going to show them. And so that was my thought process. That's fine. I'm out. And so, I don't know, I guess I was just really, really hurt. And then my eyes started opening, and then I got really for me, it was more just disillusion. I mean, I was, again, with all the questions that I had, being a member of the, of the LDS Church, and nobody willing to answer those questions, and finally telling me to, to shut up, quit asking them. To me, I was so disillusioned with the church by the time that I left it, that I had no regrets, no bad feelings. Um, I, I can tell you, the only bad feeling I have right now about the LDS Church is, is my brother was very, very active. He was going to BYU and he was set to go on a mission. Somebody said something to him just before he went on a mission. Don't know what it is to this day. He would never tell me. He just died a year ago with that in his heart. And he became atheist after that happened. And I prayed and prayed and prayed and asked him to let me pray with him to show him Jesus was there for him, and he doesn't. He said, "What good will it do? I don't believe in him." So as he was dying, I prayed on the phone with him because he lived in Baltimore, and I prayed that Jesus, as he went up, would take him by the hand and just show him that, Lord, Lord God, you are there. And uh, so no, I, I I had no no feelings whatsoever when I left, except for maybe a little a little jubilee that you know what they've got their thing, I've got mine. You know, I was so vain at that time that, that I did some really stupid stuff. Like, right after we got together, um, well, right after we moved into our house that we live in now, um, <clears throat> knock on the door, and I go answer the door as Jehovah Witnesses. And this is, be you know, long before we went to Calvary. And the first thing they said is, have you found God? And I said, I didn't know he was missing. Because in my opinion, in my opinion, I still had a relationship with God. And that's all we need. We don't need religion. We need a relationship. And so, I mean, that's just how I felt at the time. Okay. Um, did you, so you wanted to show a video? Three minutes? Yeah, not 30, but three. Three. Okay. <laughs> all right, thank you. Thank Let's, you. Thanks.